So yeah, my name's Aaron. I'm the master blender and brewer at Mikeller Baumhelm uh, on Left Saloon here in Copenhagen. Um, so just a little bit of, to build on what she kind of started. I, I studied geological sciences with emphasis in uh, geomicrobiology and biogeochemistry. Um, after I graduated and I had to go get a job, I realized that a lot of the jobs in my field in the U.S. were oil jobs in uh, places like Houston, Texas, and Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I didn't want to do that <laughs> um, for various reasons. And at the time, I was home brewing, so I, I moved into brewing. Um, I worked for several years as a normal brewer, making regular clean beers, clean beers, which I'll brush on what that is if you're not familiar. But standard beers like they brew here at Norville Blue Pills. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to branch out and learn about these other types of beers there are. And a lot of people call them sour beers. I'll, I'll refer to them mostly as wild ales because not all of them are sour. Uh, but um, So I, I wanted to apply my knowledge in microbiology and, and really apply it to brewing. So brewing to me is a combination of science and art. Um, and so I think that's what makes it special for me. So we're going to talk today about, um, we're, we're across the harbor, um, it's technically Amo, but they call it Mercedes-Benz. Um, it's an industrial shipyard. It used to be the old BMW shipyard. We have a blendery um, where we are making wild ales, sour beers, Asian oak barrels. Uh, we're also serving them there. And we have a small lab space that we can isolate these microbes uh, that are useful for making this type of beer. And so I'm just going to go into what it is. So we're a blendery, which we actually don't brew on site. Um, I brew everything at Warpix and I truck it over um, in a transport tank. Um, but we're located right on the waterfront in Brescia, and it's, it's quite a lovely view, actually. Um, so we also, like I mentioned, we have a small lab space that's dedicated to isolating, characterizing, maintaining all of our yeast and bacteria cultures that we use in our beer. Um, and we maintain and grow all of our yeast in-house, which is something that I think is unique for any brewery. Um, but one is as small as this, for sure. Um, and the address is for sale by 169B if you ever want to come out and enjoy a beer on the pier. Um, so our beers age in large oak tanks, which we call fooders. We have 12 of them on site that range anywhere between 3,000 to 7,000 liters, with the majority of them being 4,000. And then I also import uh, a large variety of different um, wine barrels from California. Most of them are Chardonnay barrels from one of my favorite wineries. Uh, these vessels are important to us because they allow micro-oxygenation to come in uh, contact with the beer, which allows the organisms to, to kind of come to life. Um, so we make sour beers, uh, or I call them wild ales with native yeast and bacteria. And most of our sour ales, we, we try to focus on using, uh, we ferment it with fruit. Um, we also make oak aged rustic, I call them Danish saisons. Um, you have to try one to see what I mean, but it's, it's a different style than the, the wild ale. But I focus mainly on trying to make beers with native or, or local ingredients, so that's even the malt and the, the grain that we use in the beers, um, or Danish, uh, the yeast and bacteria, most of it that we use is located or isolated, comes from like within 100 meters of our brewery, um, the fruits we use, um, everything I can get from Denmark I will when it's possible, so I'll try to focus on that. So I mentioned that we, we isolate a lot of wild yeast. Um, so there's hundreds of commercially available, like clean or Saccharomyces only brewer's yeast available that you can get from a variety of different yeast labs. 
Um, White Labs is actually located, one of the yeast labs that are located here in Copenhagen. They, they have, I think, something like 300 different strains of conventional brewer's yeast available in their portfolio for brewers to buy whenever they want. These make beers like pale ales or English style beers, even Belgian beers, but they're all Saccharomyces, which is a, a genus that has been industrialized to specifically make these type of beers. And so they, they're workhorses. They're, they've been you know, selected and industrialized for these reasons because they're really friendly to brewers and they have desirable results, they, they're predictable, they're all the things that what I do aren't. Um, but there's only a dozen or so commercially available wild yeast strains and typically these yeast strains fall in the, the genus of like Britannomyces. Um, there's also several different bacteria cultures available. Uh, but when I started doing this, I was kind of like, you know, you can't just make one beer with one or two different yeasts. Uh, you really need to kind of branch out. In the air, there's hundreds of these yeasts available. You just have to start like picking them out and figuring out which ones are useful for, for making these types of beers. So, good wild ales are, are so much more than just Britannomyces. So, Britannomyces is kind of, for a long time, was kind of the wild yeast, so you, you would call the yeast lab and say, I want your one Britannomyces yeast strain, you know, and they would send it to you, and that was, you're making an exotic beer then. Um, but there was a lot of other stuff that come in to play, um, and, and, and they're not commercially available. And so, we'll get into some of it in a little bit, but really, um, there's spontaneously fermented ales where people just leave their, their, their unfermented beer out to cool overnight and whatever's in the air inoculates the beer, and this is popular in Belgium. Uh, and there's, there's hundreds of different organisms that come into play. So the real big reason why, why I do this and, and why we do this is, is terroir. So it's a sense of place. I mean, really actually getting something that's local to your part of the world and implementing it into the product that you're making. Um, and if everybody's using the same yeast, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to make unique beers. So I decided that it was time that I would go and find these things. So typically, we find these, these wild yeast in places where yeast feed. So yeast need food, just like anything else that's alive. And yeast like sugar. So we typically, when we're going out into the field and we're looking for wild yeast, we'll go and say, let's look for flowers, fruit skins. We can pull them out of the air because they're floating around. They blow off flowers and stuff like that. Uh, Bark's another great one. Uh, out where we are located on Red Saloon, there's trees, apple trees. Uh, there's bramble bushes, so blackberries. Uh, we've tried grasses, wild hops. Um, there's plenty of bark and, of course, lots of lots of beer. So, um, the objective to this when we're going out and selecting or trying to select for these things is that we want to make sure that we're looking for things that are actually useful for making beer with. So, we're actually trying to select for organisms that are going to be useful for making beer. So we, we have a couple of ways that we do that to start off with. So we start by taking unfermented beer, what we call wort, and we, we sterilize it in an autoclave. And that becomes our media that we're using to try to capture these organisms with beer. So we actually are starting with unfermented beer. So the, the chemical composition of that is, is complex enough that it gets rid of a lot of things that won't be useful for making beer. Um, so we'll go to the field and we'll, we'll aseptically collect samples. So that means, you know, make sure that we're not contaminating them with something else. And we'll add those, those samples to unfermented beer. So here you can see, I think there's a blackberry and uh, 125 milliliters of sterile work beer. Um, we can also try to pull organisms from the air. So we'll leave a, a, a captured jar or a, a Erlenmeyer flask outside with some sterile cheesecloth on top of it, some bugs and dirt and debris and they fly in there and get it kind of all dirty. Uh, so once we've gone and collected potential samples, we bring it back to the lab and we let them kind of 
to start a natural fermentation. Um, so after maximum two weeks, um, we have a natural fermentation. We'll dilute the samples and we'll streak the samples or, or plate them on various media. Uh, the types of media that we use. Um, so media being, a, we, we make an agar plate um, with a different kind of nutrient agar in it. So we use YPD, which is yeast, peptone, dextrose. It's a good general purpose media. Uh, basically anything grows on it, so it's useful for that. Uh, we make another one with malt extract added to it. So malt extract is basically like condensed beer. So we're adding complex sugars that are found in beer. Uh, kind of ice, like select for organisms that are useful for making beer. Uh, so yeah, and then we have a couple of media that we use that are actually select for certain organisms. So we use uh, Wallerstein differential egg, which contains cyclohexamide, uh, which is a really toxic chemical that prevents the growth of most eukaryotic cells, except for Britannomyces, which is kind of the mother bugger of all wild ale kind of microorganisms, and a few of his friends, so a couple of different bacteria, uh, some other organisms we grow in this media. So we have a couple of different weapons that we try to use to, to grow these things on after they've gone into natural fermentation. So you can look at uh, a couple photos I brought here, so we'll plate them, we'll put them on a petri dish, and we'll incubate them usually around 30 degrees in our incubator. And what we get is usually something that looks like this, or this, this is streaking out. So you can kind of see here, uh, as we get down the line, the streaks are going back and forth. You get individual colonies here. So these are pure colonies of, of, of yeast. Same with this. Um, this one is just diluted and then spread across the plate itself. And you can see there's actually two different organisms growing on this one. We got one here that's kind of absorbed this uh, green dye that's in the media and then these smaller white cells. Um, this is one that we're actually actively still working on and trying to identify what each one of these organisms is. So the thought is right now that maybe one of them is bacteria. And you can see a couple different ones uh, here. So some of them uh, get kind of colorful. Uh, some of them get quite big. It's, it kind of just turns into a fun picture to see how it looks So after we've plated and we've isolated, like I talked about, we can pluck these single colonies here, either with sterile loop or needle, and we can begin to really actually isolate single organisms from, a, from one capture. Um, so we want to be able to identify what these is. I, I can look at them in the microscope, I can smell them, I can look at them on the plate, but I really don't know what they are until we grow the DNA or extract DNA, grow it, and then send the DNA samples to an external lab which sends back a sequence. Um, so in the photo here, we're doing an electrophoresis, which um, allows us to at least tell if there's DNA present that has been extracted from the sample. These bands are different bands of proteins. And you can see in the, some of them, each, each band represents a different sample, uh, and some of them have similar uh, characteristics. So was, you kind of try to infer so maybe they're the same organism. We don't know until we get the results back. Um, so after we get the results back and we have an idea of what we're working with, we'll sit down and we'll start to do tests on them. So we literally will grow the organism um, and pitch it into unfermented beer again and let it naturally ferment once again only as a pure culture. And we'll start to take measurements on it. So we'll measure the sugar content before, during, and after fermentation, which gives us an idea on if, if 
they actually ferment sugar and turn it into an alcohol and CO2. Um, we can also measure how tolerant to alcohol they are. Sometimes they'll ferment just a, a little bit of the sugar and then they die out because they're creating alcohol, which is a volatile substance. And then the most important part is, do they taste good? I mean, is this something that we actually want to use? Is it, is it a worthy organism? So that can be tricky, and that's the trickiest part because by themselves, they do things differently than when they're with their friends, and so we sometimes it's just a little bit of rolling the decks. But we definitely try to do a little bit of tests beforehand to know that it's not something that completely tastes like shit. So, so far of this project, we found just a handful of different organisms. We've only been doing it for nine months. We've gone through two rounds of sequencing, <laughs> and the results are still kind of coming in, but at first glance, we're finding a lot of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a most common brewer's yeast is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. What we've done is actually found wild Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so these are organisms that haven't been industrialized for use in brewing. Um, we found several different strains of these, uh, one of them in particular is a workhorse that ferments almost all the sugar in here. It um, makes it kind of a, a really great aroma. So we've, we've implemented this into our oak aging project. Then we have Hensinia spora, um, which is a yeast that is commonly found in Lambic or spontaneously fermented beer. It creates some fruity aromas. It's also found in natural wine. So we found different, three different species, Nubarum, Mariah, and then Albionesis, which is actually named after the area We found uh, two different Kikia strains, um, which are also found in natural wine and spontaneously fermented beer. They also create some really interesting fruity aromas. And then we have this Mechkinicolia, I'm not even really sure how to pronounce that. It's the first time we try to say it out loud. Um, and we found several different species, and we've, we've seen a couple different papers about popping up in natural wine. Not really sure what it brings to the table yet, but there is some potential there. We've also found a bunch of other yeasts that aren't useful for brewing that are worth mentioning today. One of them is a pathogen, only to immunocompromised patients, but it is nonetheless um, pathogenic. Uh, and it's actually quite common. So what's next? After all of this is done, after we've gone out in the field, collected the samples, brought them back to the lab, fermented it, isolated it, identified it, characterized it, it passes all the tests and we're ready. So we actually will grow them up from single cells to quantities needed to ferment like 7,000 liters of beer. So it usually starts a stage before this, they have a great photo or one going to take a great photo, but it starts in about 200 milliliters. And then we'll go to about now it's 2,500 milliliters. Um, and then it goes into a yeast propagation tank that we have on site, which basically is a sterile tank that we pump lots and lots of sterile oxygen through the yeast of oxygen. And our media that we're using to grow it is unfermented beer, work again uh, with a lot of yeast nutrients. Um, so yeah, we, we can grow these things up to quantities that we need to so that's kind of it. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I'm always posting like photos of the lab and kind of like everyday life. You can follow me on Instagram, which you can see my bike. Um, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> yes, they're non pathogenic. That's the question. They, they're not going to make you sick. Yeah. Um, there's actually kind of this old, you know, home brewers have been preaching it to each other for years that no, no known pathogens from beer <laughs> um, because typically they're alcohol and pH intolerant. But our experiments and time after time finding at least this one 
pathogenic yeast only immunocompromised like old people. That they exist, but most of the stuff we get will never be used. You had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, so, what's the success rate? I mean, because you go outside and you try to catch the yeah. wild what? yeast. So, what's. So from whatever that you go do out there, you put the, I don't know how many flasks, there are many flasks that you say to catch them. So, what's the success rate to get something that you actually can use? So, we always get something. Okay. <laughs> now, whether or not we can use it, we've, that's probably 50%. Okay. I mean, we get a lot of the same stuff. And so we're, we're now trying to look at ways that we can select for other stuff. Um, but we're trying to do it in a way that's methodical and like, you know, we can apply a scientific method to. So we can't just go start changing everything overnight. Um, so things we've considered to try to like find new things or improve our success rate is like you know, different times, different medias, uh, season, seasonal. Can definitely play a role. So right now we've gone some, from late summer until early spring, but a lot of a lot of stuff happens when flowers are blooming and during the, the, the late spring. So this is something that we're we're going to continue to investigate, hopefully build on as we can continue, continue this project in the future. Uh, he had his hand up behind you, and then I have a very simple question. Um, why do you do this? In the search of uh, new taste or new property. Why? Right, so. <laughs> you expect why? To why, I do, why I do it is because, one, there's I'm, I'm looking for stuff that I can't just go buy. And two, because there's a lot of things out there in the air on plants and that are really useful and have new taste that you can't just go buy. So all these different organisms have a little bit of different kind of flavors and aromas and, and properties that they make. And there's there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of them across the world. The ones that the yeast lab get are usually isolated from bottles of Belgian Lambic. So why, why do I want something from Belgium when I have this opportunity to take organisms from the air or from fruit that are grown in my backyard and that can produce something that no one else has the ability to give? Another question. Uh, can yeast uh, taste uh, dramatically different? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the reason why, why commercial yeast labs that make yeast breweries have 300 different strains. They produce different esters and, and, and phenols, and, and it, you know it's kind of beyond the scope of this just isolating wild yeast. But there's a there's a lot of different flavor components. Um, that you can that they create, and, and under different circumstances too, you can take the same yeast and put it at different temperatures with a different wort or, or different different chemical compositions, and get a lot of different types of flavors out. Of it. So this project is really aimed at trying to find something that no one else has the opportunity to get. And, and I've done it in other places in the world. I came from California and I did it there too. And I'm finding so much different stuff here in Copenhagen. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of Three more. Three. One, two, three, and then you can discuss over some more yeast from the bar. Okay? Yeah. Yeast juice. She picked the order. Who was the next? One, two, three. I think those were the hands I saw. Okay, so I guess you, you sort of answered this a little bit, but I was just like, I guess you were saying that there were hundreds of commercial strains, but I guess they're a very small fraction of what's sort of out there. So if I if I go out without any fancy selectors or anything, how like how many species could I find? Like so, this, this is actually something that is easily able to utilize at home with some really basic tools. But you can find the same stuff I'm finding. You know, this this isn't just you know anybody can do this. It's just brewers want to brew. Safe. No, but I'm just I'm just curious about like what's the what's the scale like how many are we talking hundreds of thousands of different strains or like that out there just in the wild like in my neck of the woods or, or yeah yeah general? like just uh, yeah. well I, I yeah I mean if you think about how small these are uh, you know on a cellular level it could be I mean I'm, we're we're actually trying to find that out. Okay. 
we're seeing we're seeing some biodiversity, not as much as we're hoping to, but like I said, this is something that we need to try to expand our, our tests for, and, and we're trying to do that systematically rather than just changing everything yeah. overnight at the drop of a hat. So very often, the very close to everyday is strains. They have very different products. I mentioned that you use the ECI. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's a single gene that we're trying to look at to determine which kind of that's. Yeah, we're looking at two different ones. What? We're looking at two different genes. Okay. Does that have the resolvability that you need to tell which gene to look at and the reason to look at way before you move it to that one? To tell what can this have already be? So the way we're, what we're looking at now is, is not a full genome sequence. So it is really just going to give us a genus and species of it. There's, like White Labs has 300 different Saccharomyces cerevisiae in their catalog alone that you can purchase on a daily basis. Each one of those strains has many different properties, fermentation, flavor, everything else. In order to really narrow it down, and, and even if you did, there's hundreds of different subspecies within the species that produce many different flavors uh, within that species. So it's, it's not safe to say that just one single species is going is to produce one single flavor or, or fermentation property. But we can't necessarily just look at it even with a full genome sequence. <laughs> it, it'll help, but there, there's a lot more at it, you know, than just looking at it from, from a genus and species point of view. I mean, there's, a, there's actually applying it to the real world. And yeah, so... Part, I mean, a full genome sequence would give you a, a good identification with what this whole thing is. Yes. Absolutely. Correct. And, that, and that's why we, we try to test them just, just with next-gen sequencing, just so we have an idea that we're not wasting our time with something that we know isn't useful for brewing, right? Because we, we have an idea. On, on organisms that will ferment wort, that will ferment the sugar and the, the complex sugar that is in unfermented beer. So we kind of can weed out a lot of the, the candidates just by, by taking a, a quick glance at it, and then we can move forward with fermentation tests after that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, last one. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so um, what I'm hearing is uh, yeast strains. It's kind of like a note in music. Only there's way more. So if you put a C in the music piece, you uh, can make millions of different songs. It's the same with yeast, but just even more, right? It's a lovely analogy. Actually. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I that's guess, not my so, question, by the way. It yeah, was just a statement. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and you know, one note sounds one way, but when you combine it with four other notes, it, it makes a whole different sound. Yes. And the same can be with flavors that you used to produce, or, or cooking, or any any tor sort of whether sensory thing. whether you where you find it or how you treat it and all these things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But my question is, uh, yeah, have you found anything out there and sent it to the lab and then they sent back an email saying, we don't know what this is. You get to name it. No, we haven't found anything yet, but we have gotten some inconclusive results. I think. Well, where the probability of it being one thing or another is almost equal, which is, sends a really confusing signal. You know, 99% it could be this, or 99% it could be So it could be a new thing. Well, or we just haven't tested for the right, we haven't looked at the right chunk of DNA. It requires further analysis. Okay. But no, we have not found anything new yet that we get to, uh, Damn it. to make.